Welcome to the party, pal. Your friendly neighborhood master chaos back with you once again. Today is Sunday, and something I like to do every Sunday is discuss an entire box set with you. And since it is July 2021, and it is currently the Criterion 50% off sale at Barnes & Nobles, I thought we'd take a look at the Lone Wolf & Cub box set from Criterion Spine number 840. One, I'm going to give you a review of all six movies in the box set. I'm also going to talk about the special features and the packaging and all that good stuff. So I hope you'll join me for all that goodness. Cue the theme song. Back, back, back from the dead. <laughs> This is, dare I say, an unexpected release from the Criterion Collection. Normally when you think Criterion, you think Tokyo Story, you think 400 Blows, you know, you think foreign cinema that some could describe as boring or tedious. You certainly wouldn't describe the Criterion Collection in general as something that would encompass something so violent and bloody as the Lone Wolf and Cub movies. But lo and behold... It does, and that's the beauty, in my mind, of the Criterion Collection. They they cannot be readily defined. They have a ton of samurai films. As a matter of fact, they have, uh, I think, almost more samurai films than uh, than more kind of weepy, boring dramas. And Low Wolf and Cub stands head and shoulders above most of those films, not only because it's in color, uh, but because it is uh, infamous as a very violent film franchise, and it's rightfully so let's dig in this set comes with all six movies and uh, of course it's based on the manga now i know the franchise from the manga it actually is the first manga i ever read that's what got me into uh manga or you know japanese comics you know what that is uh here's a, a little bit of the um look at the artwork from the original manga so I knew the manga very well, and then I discovered, holy shit, they made movies. Pfft, I gotta track these movies down. I have a DVD set of them. I'm blanking on an Amigo. Somebody put them out. Anyway, I've seen them on DVD. Blu-ray came out. You gotta upgrade. It's a, it's a criterion. You know they're gonna take care of it. Here you have a three-disc set. Now, uh, I'll break this down uh, for you a little bit more in detail. Six movies, three movies on each disc so you've got three and three the third disc is all special features now i'll talk about special features later on but just a heads up none of the uh discs with the movies have any special features on them i think they just like trailers and things like that so no commentary tracks on the movies which is a bummer but whatever if it's impossible to get a commentary track it's impossible to get a commentary track i'm sure they tried let's talk about a disc one film one now Bear with me, because I had to take notes, as I've seen these movies, you know, at least once before, but the plots and the titles are so similar that uh, you and I are both going to get lost uh, as we wind our way through the mysteries of the Lone Wolf and Cub franchise. Let's talk about part one. Lone Wolf and Cub Sword of Vengeance is part one. It establishes our storyline. This is very much... The entire franchise, I should say, is very much a continuing storyline, but also episodic at the same time, and I'll, I'll get into that. So keep that in mind. They are episodic, but they do sort of continue the story as it goes along. Sort of Vengeance introduces us to Ogami Ito, or Ito Ogami, however you want to pronounce it. Uh, they, they, everybody pronounces it different orders. We'll call him Ito. Ito and his son Daigoro... Uh, they are um, a proud samurai family, the Ogami family, and he is the samurai executioner. He is, uh, I'm sorry, not the samurai executioner, he's, he's, he's the shogunate executioner. Samurai executioner is a spinoff, not spinoff, but it's another manga from the same creators. He's the shogun's executioner, his private executioner. What he does is he goes and he kills you know, the, the lords and, and, and vassals or whoever that like sort of disagree with the emperor his, or the, the Shogun, his uh, job is to go and behead them. You know, they have to commit harakiri, they stab their stomachs, and he's the one that finishes them 
with a head chop. And it's it's uh, really strikingly amplified in the beginning of part one, where uh, the movie kicks off with the ritual beheading of a two-year-old uh, boy who is uh, who is like sort of the heir of the throne of this particular clan, and uh, it's Ito's job to behead him because for some reason he's angered uh, the Shogun. Right off the bat, you know this movie's not fucking around, this series is not fucking around. They're killing a two-year-old boy in the beginning of the movie. Now, you don't see it, it's not very graphic, but you get it. I mean, a sword comes down, and you just see a lot of blood spray, but it's full-grown people, so it's fine. You know, for the most part, it's fine. So, we've established that he's sort of a, um, a heartless guy, and we see him go home, and he has a young son, about the same age as the boy he just decapitated. He's got a loving wife, and it turns out that the Yagyu clan, the Yagyu, however you want to pronounce it, they want uh, to take his position as the executioner, and to do so, they're going to frame him. Uh, they do this by killing his wife and planting some kind of, again, th now there's a lot in here that's very Japanese-y, and it's not going to translate when it comes to an American, you know, westernized audience. They plant some kind of idol on this altar that makes it look as if he's praying for the death of, of the shogunate. Uh, he's not, but it, it looks bad. So, and they also frame him for the death of his wife, even though he's saying, it wasn't me, it was, you know, this guy, you know, some ninjas came, they killed my wife, and they, they, they planted that, that's not mine. The Yagyu are like, no, it's you, it's you, you know, um, because of this, this is disrespectful, we have, you have to kill yourself. Of course, he's not going to do it, and he decides to go on the run and, and become an assassin for hire. There's a great scene in this that really establishes the tone and the feel of the movie, where his little son, Daigoro, who was actually maybe one year old or less at the time, uh, he shows him a ball, and he shows him a samurai sword, and he says, Daigoro, whichever path you choose will be, the, will be the, the path that decides the rest of your life. If you choose the ball, you want joy, which means you cannot be with me because I'm going to walk the demon way in hell. And uh, if you choose the sword, that means you will walk the demon away with me and I'll let you live. But if you choose the ball, I'm, I'll kill you and send you, and, and send you to, to heaven so your mom can take care of you. The boy luckily chooses the sword and father and son, Lone Wolf and Cub, go off on their journey. After a battle with the Yagyus, uh, he is, his name is sort of cleared in essence um, in terms of like um, them pursuing him or wanting his ritual suicide. He defeats one of the members of the Yagyu. He makes a deal, if I kill you, then you let me go, you know, leave leave the town and I'll just be a, you know, be a ronin and, and be an assassin for hire kind of a thing. And they're like, yeah, fine. He defeats the guy, he goes off on his journey. Now, I mentioned the films are very episodic and here is why. The, everything I just said is about 40, 45 minutes of the, of the first movie. The second half is him being hired uh, as Lone Wolf and Cub, the traveling assassin. So we have set up. And the second half of the movie is just some random assignment that I'm I'm going to spare you the details. Basically, he goes on some random assignment in this hot spring to um, kill some bandits or something. I'm not going to say it's, it's forgettable, but it certainly isn't the meat or the crux of the story. Uh, but we just, that happens. That, 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 that's something you have to kind of get used to because that will repeat throughout all these movies. You will see that kind of storytelling repeating, and I feel... Uh, that's a, both a positive and a negative for this franchise. Uh, let me explain. Uh, the positive is it makes these movies very rewatchable because so much happens in each movie that uh, it's hard to remember every detail. That's why I had to take notes. So many little things happen, whether he's getting chased by the Yagyus or he goes on some kind of mission that he's hired for. That mission mutates into something else that leads to the Yagyus. There's a lot in this. It's almost like a James Bond movie. Those are very rewatchable because there's so much that happens in every movie. The, the, the negative is it makes the movies feel too similar. The only one that really stands out is the last one, uh, White Heaven in Hell or White Hell in Heaven. I don't even remember the, the, the phrasing. I have to look at my notes before we talk about that one. But the only, one, the only reason that stands out is because it takes place in the snow. All the other ones are very similar story-wise, plot-wise, and that's a problem. That's definitely a negative because I can't necessarily point out and say, oh, that is the best entry. Um, although I do have a fond uh, sort of soft spot for part four, and I'll talk about part four when I get there. But that aside, um, the franchise is worth a watch. Let me state that right off the bat. Anyway, so that's part one. 
Part one is a good movie. It's not a great movie. It's a rough start because of that weird stop-start storytelling where like you've set this up, but you haven't paid off the Yagyu storyline. And now we're on some random quest that, you know, we're not really connected to in any way beyond the fact that we want Ito and Daigoro to live. But that leads us to part two and the installment that I think people consider the best in the franchise. And that is the Lone Wolf and Cub Baby Cart at the River Styx. This one is the bloodiest and the James Bondiest. And, we'll, and, and now we mentioned James Bond in terms of plotting, but here James Bond means gadgets. We, we discover that our baby cart, this little rough hewn little wooden box that Daigoro sits in, is full of fucking gadgets. Swords pop out. It's got a Gatlin gun. I mean, it's got everything. And it, it definitely elevates it above other samurai films of the like, especially Zatoichi type, uh, type movies. Which, by the way, Shintaro Katsu Zatoichi produced these movies for his brother, uh, Tomisoburi Wakayama, who is, of course, uh, Ogami Ito. So there's a little connection to Zatoichi there, which is very cool. The second one is good. It's definitely the bloodiest one. It's the one that moves, you know, around the most, but it is the most episodic one. It's, it's one where a, a plot line is developed, and then it, it feels like it gets resolved very quickly we're about 30 minutes in something gets resolved you're like well what what what, what else is there what, what what are we doing here what, what is this movie and then it takes side streets here and there but but the whole franchise does that not a bad movie but one that you have to sort of be prepared for very unconventional storytelling but it, it, you go for the blood and guts for part two definitely uh, this one brings the blood and guts low and cub three baby cart to hades is uh a weird one. It's definitely the rapiest one. It's not the bloodiest one, but it is the rapiest one. I think there's multiple rapes right at the beginning. I mean, they're not very graphic, but they're there, and they're always, you know, distasteful. Uh, it's it's one that suffers from a, a overabundance of characters. There's way too many characters in this movie, and that just complicates the story too much. There's just too much going on. And it, uh, frankly, it becomes confusing and it becomes something that instantly checks you out. At least that's the case with me. It's it's a good film, but it's it's definitely a little too heavy-handed when it comes to all the character stuff. However, the finale does sneak up on you. It has a very Spaghetti Western-esque finale, which I personally appreciate. I love a good Spaghetti Western. And, and the, the finale certainly redeemed the movie. But I wouldn't say Baby Cart to Hades is my favorite installment, um, which is a shame. But I, like I said, because of the fact, because of the fact that so much happens in these movies, in a couple months, I'm not even gonna remember what happens in these movies, and I'm gonna go, oh, I should probably re revisit those, and then I probably had the same, you know, the same thoughts when I watched them on DVD. Then I'll watch them again and be like, oh right, yeah, okay, I remember now. And then six months later, what were they? What, what happened in that one? I don't remember, because they're so similar, and that's that's the main issue. Anyway, that's disc one. Before we get to disc two, please remember to drop a like on this video if you're having a good time, and I really hope you are. If you're new here, do me a favor, consider subscribing. If you do, we'll get to hang out again. And honestly, I'm having a great time hanging out with you. I want to continue to do so, my friend. It is an honor to uh, share some time with you and discuss cinema. Disc 2 brings us part 4, 5, and 6, and part 4 is Lone Wolf and Cub, Baby Cart in Peril. And I gotta say, this is probably my favorite one. Uh, I would give this one 5 stars. The other ones, I, I think I would have trouble rating, but I really enjoyed part 4, Baby Cart in Peril. Uh, it starts off brilliantly with blood-splattered boobs. Good way to start your movie. It's about a tattooed woman who has become an assassin. Her name is Okio, o -O Okio something like that. Uh, of course, uh, Ito has been hired to kill her uh, because uh, she has angered the Yagyu clan for some reason. Or there's the Yagyu clan's involved in some capacity, and so um, Ogami has to take her out, but he feels pity for her. And that's something I, I really appreciate about Ito. He's very, as cold-blooded and unemotional as he is, he's very aware of, of, of honor and respect and people's feelings. And... Uh, even though he has a task and he has to kill this woman, he honors her vengeance. He honors her journey. And it is a beautiful film to watch. I mean, they're all very beautiful films, very lush looking movies. But I think Baby Cart in Peril is the standout because of the fact that essentially Ito is going up against, 
his mirror. Uh, Okio is a, a woman seeking revenge, and she has um, tread upon the demon path, as uh, Ito calls his journey with Daigoro. And uh, they walk together for a while. They become partners for a while. And uh, it's very unique. It's a very different film, and I think it stands uh, out from the pack, from the rest of the episodic nature of the other installments. I do like this one the best. I, I, it's, it's one that you shouldn't start you know, with because they are very much a, a succession of films, and you don't want to start in part four because I, I think you'd feel left out. You're like, well, who's the guy with the eye patch? Like, all that kind of stuff. I haven't even talked about the guy with the eye patch. Um, we'll get to him. But uh, it's a solid movie and probably my favorite uh, of the entire collection, you know, right there with part two. Not very blood splattery, but you do get a lot of like limbs hacked off. Lots of arms and legs get hacked off. Um, it's pretty good. It's, it's, it's a very impressive movie. So I do give that one the highest marks. Part five, Baby Cart in the Land of Demons is kind of messy. I mean, they're all very messy plot wise. But it's enjoyable. We do get an uh, underwater assassination, which is you know new for the series. Uh, essentially what uh, happens in this one is uh, Ito has been tasked with the assassination of a priest who is doubling as a, I guess, a spy or kind of like co-head of some secret ninja organization that's tied to the Yagyu clan in some way, shape, or form. And uh, he has to uh, kill this priest because he's got a letter that will, I think, undo something when it comes to a certain clan and 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 uh, the validity of the person in power. Very interesting movie. Again, very much something that relies on historical data uh, of the Japanese culture, of Japanese rituals, of Japanese hierarchies. So somebody who really knows that will get more out of this story. A Westerner who has no idea what happens in Japan or what happened in feudal Japan is going to be a little lost when it comes to certain choices that are made in this movie. I don't want to get too spoilery on this because part of the fun is discovering all these little side roads and beyond the fact that the plot is messy, there's a lot of fun to be had uh, with uh, Land of Demons. But uh, just keep in mind that it's, it's very unconventional storytelling. And I think by now we sort of know uh, where the, uh, I guess, the DNA of these movies is going. We know the formula already. We're going to get a little bit of the development of the Yagyu clan trying to take out Ito and then he's going to get hired to, to do some assignment. And then maybe Daigoro will get lost and have a little side quest. And then they'll meet up and then, you know, there'll be a duel or something. They all sort of share the same DNA for better or worse. I, I'm, I'm, I lean towards worse because it makes them not stand out as much from each other. They, they feel very much... It almost feels like one big miniseries. I guess that's the best way to describe it. It feels like one big miniseries and not individual installments. Whereas with the Bond movies... Moonraker is very different from uh, View to a Kill, for example. View to a Kill is very different from License to Kill. So uh, there's not a lot of that in this. So keep that in mind. But if, if, you, if that sounds interesting to you, you're going to get a six-part miniseries, essentially, with, 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 with a caveat, uh, which we'll discuss right now, because we're going to talk about the, the, the sixth and final installment. And that would be Lone Wolf and Cub, White Heaven in Hell. This one is one of the most distinct ones, only because half of it takes place in the snow. You get a little bit of snow action in the beginning, and then at the end you get um, the finale, the big finale, which is a pretty fantastic finale. It turns out to be the finale of the franchise. Um, all takes place in the snow. This one's uh, also interesting for the fact that he goes up against what can really only be described as supernatural ninjas. There's these three ninja guys who uh, are tasked with taking him out. And they seem to possess some type of supernatural ability. You see them floating. You see them projecting their voice, kind of like this godly ghost voice. So they must uh, have some kind of supernatural power. They cannot just be really fucking good ninjas. I mean, maybe that's the case, but that's just how I interpreted uh, the film. Uh, the story uh, revolves around Retsudo Yagyu, who is sort of our big uh, antagonist. He is the patriarch of the Yagyu clan. And uh, he's, for the, since part one, has been trying to take out Ito. He's the one behind the framing and the murderous wife and things like that. In a previous film, uh, Ito stabbed him in the eye, so he's been wearing an eye patch for like, I think the last three movies. Uh, anyway, this is the final confrontation. At least that's what we're led to believe. Uh, and he decides to um, visit his estranged son, 
who is a member of some kind of ninja cult. And the son's like, fuck you, you abandoned me. I'm going to use my ninjas to kill Ito. And then I'm going to be the executioner. I guess everybody really likes that job. So they, everybody's out to get it. I don't know. So that's the plot here. The Yagyus are warring in a way uh, amongst themselves to finish off Ito. And uh, we think we're going to get a big final battle. And we do get a final battle. However, and, and slight spoilers because I need to prepare you for this. If you want to know how the manga ends, how the franchise ends, then I would say, you know, skip ahead a minute. Skip ahead a minute. And actually, you know what? I'll even put a um, put a chapter stop. Go to that next chapter stop if you don't want to find out the ending of, of Lone Wolf and Cub. Because I feel you should know how the story ends because we never got a f finale here. At the end of uh, part six, Kletzo leaves. Uh, to fight again another day. I'll see you next time. Ha ha ha. And I thought it was gonna we were gonna get the finale that we got in the manga. In the manga, Ito is killed uh, by Retsudo. He dies, uh, and Daigoro is left alone. He is orphaned, but he accepts. You know, he cries, but he accepts that his father chose the demon path, and he knew eventually he would have to die. Uh, it's even spoken about in the special features when we talk to the creator. He said, there's no other way to end it except that he will have to die. And that's what happens in the manga. In the movie, he lives to fight another day. They ride off into the sunset, the snowy landscape. And that's the end of the movie. Disappointed! I will say part six stands out because it has the supernatural ninjas. And it has that, that snowbound finale. But it does suffer from the same problems of too many characters, too many side plots and side quests. And and not enough sort of sticking to a linear story. And I guess you could say that's realistic. That's that's how life is. Life doesn't really play by the rules. So in a way, there's a, something punk rock to that way of making a film. Uh, but for Western audiences, we may have trouble accepting that. I, however, really love these movies. But like I said, they're not 100% memorable. Which is a good thing because that means I'll be able to rewatch this in a year and be... Surprised, amazed, and astounded uh, for various reasons. That is disc two. Let's talk about the special features on disc three. Disc three is jam-packed with featurettes and interviews, uh, most notably an interview with Katsuo Kuike. I'm, I'm pretty sure I butchered that, Ka Ka Katsuo Kuike. I apologize if I butchered that. I'm trying my best. Uh, he is the writer of the manga, and he talks about the inception, the reception, and then, of course, the finale, which I'm not going to spoil here. I already did it. Don't worry. If you skip ahead, I'm not going to say what happens. But he talks about the inevitability of the story, and it's, it's wonderful to hear him talk. I think it's about 18 minutes or so. Uh, then you get an interview with a sword master who practices the particular sword style. Uh, so, so I want to say it's like Suyo Ryo. Sui, Sui Ryo. Something like that. It's a sword style that's practiced by Ogami Ito in the films. It's a real sword style. And uh, the current master of that style speaks about it and the legacy and, and how difficult it is to keep it going. I think that was a very interesting uh, special feature on there. And what you also get on here, beyond some other stuff, which I, I'm not going to mention, I'm just going to highlight my favorites, you get a silent documentary about the making of a samurai sword. How badass is that? You get to see... The Making of a Samurai Sword, it's, I, I believe the documentary from the 1930s or something like that. It's silent, maybe 1920s, but uh, really great stuff. Uh, it's um, not remastered, so it's, you know, it's black and white, and it's kind of like rough looking, but kind of makes it more badass. I see The Making of a Samurai Sword um, uh, in that way, in the old-fashioned way. It's fantastic. And that is the entire box set of... Lone Wolf and Cub. But we're not done. Because with the box set, you get something else. And where did I put it? I put it right here. Let me put this aside here. Oh, you get a booklet. Now, the booklet is, as you would expect, make sure there's no nudity here because there's plenty of nudity in the films. I don't think there is any. You get pictures, right? Full color pictures. Of course, you get the typical writing. This is a really thick book. Not your typical kind of pamphlet style that you would see from... Uh, criterion nowadays a little bit about the movies technical uh, the cast and crew a little bit about the reception uh, really really great stuff in this booklet it's a nice essential piece to it because without the commentary track 
you don't get a lot of the you know historical backdrop you don't get a lot of the sort of you know you don't get a real grasp of the reception for the movies um normally because it's it's lacking from the special features you don't get a commentary track but the booklet does help and uh by the way when you get it the booklet fits in here uh it's it's not one that you slip on the side it's it's designed like this so when you get it out it might fall out you'll be like what the hell is this that's the, it, the, i don't know it's designed that way i'm not a big fan of digi books but whatever this is the only way to get the movie is the only way to get the movie that's how i feel about it Love Wolf and Cub, six film collection from Criterion Collection, Spine 841. Should you get it? 100% yes. 100% yes. Uh, during the, the Barnes & Noble sale, I believe it's 50 bucks. 50 bucks for six movies, uh, six historically important uh, films, not just the samurai cinema, but the cinema in general. If you love Quentin Tarantino, if you love Takeshi Miike, uh, gosh, if you love any of those guys, uh, Shinya Tsukamoto, you're going to see a lot of influences on those guys from these movies, and you're going to get a kick out of them. This is definitely bang for your buck. Um, just don't sh shotgun them all in, in a couple days like I did, because you will exhaust yourself. <laughs> you will exhaust yourself. These are pretty exhausting movies, um, but they're 100% worth your time. Okay, pal, that'll do. I hope you enjoyed this box set Sunday review of the Lone Wolf and Cub films from Criterion. Uh, I love that set, and uh, I'm curious if you guys have it, so let me know in the comments down below. Either way, if you're going to get it or if you have it, I'm, I'm curious what your thoughts are. Um, on your way out the door, please leave me a thumbs up. If you're new here, do subscribe. I'll see you soon. Remember, I love you. As a matter of fact, I love you just the way you are.